On our way back from picking up some food during last week's Super Bowl Sunday, my youngest daughter asked me a question point blank that I had to ponder a bit before I could give her a well thought out answer. She asked, Why do you think Bigfoot exists, Daddy? Both of my daughters know about the Paranormal Nothing podcast, of course, and I've tried to instill in them, at every opportunity I get, a sense of wonder about the unusual and the mysterious in the world. But this seemingly simple question got me thinking about why, for many years, I have been a believer in the existence of Bigfoot. I mean, I don't go out quote-unquote squatching, but I'd like to believe that I've read enough about the phenomena to be able to give an educated and well-informed reason for my belief in the existence of the creature. But my daughter's question made me ponder again if the existence of Bigfoot slash Sasquatch could be looked at more objectively from a scientific perspective while at the same time allow for consideration of the human slash personal point of view when it came to the existence of Sasquatch. To be honest, I've spoken with enough people in my travels throughout the west coast of the United States to be able to state that all of them could not be lying at the same time when I've asked them about their Bigfoot sightings. Some of these individuals worked in the forestry sector and some owned large farms. Their encounters with Bigfoot could all not have been made up, statistically speaking. These stories told to me, even if they were from credible and believable eyewitnesses, were just stories nevertheless, and human tendency is to at times embellish and fill in the narrative gaps when it comes to the verbal telling of a story. So I continued pondering my daughter's question, and came to the conclusion that the best scientific evidence for the existence of Bigfoot would be if we had a body, living or dead, that could be dissected and analyzed by experts. If we had a specimen of this nature, and if scientists could then, based on studying it, determine if it came from an unknown species of upright ape that was previously unclassified in zoology, then there would be no further arguments about whether or not Bigfoot existed. But that is not the case, as you, purveyors of the paranormal nothing, know. So the answer to my daughter, after much thought, was simple. Although I want to believe, based on the stories I've heard from credible people, I ultimately can't because there is no scientific evidence, like a body, dead or alive, that we could run tests on to determine what kind of animal or hominid it might be. I've talked to my daughters about the scientific method, in order for them to understand the concept of testing and validating a hypothesis, and of the importance of being able to obtain similar results when repeating an experiment more than once, as long as your initial parameters were predefined. But I thought to myself then, how close has mainstream science got into actually studying the Bigfoot phenomena from this lens of objective scientific analyses? Even if we do not have an actual Bigfoot body to analyze, what other methods and areas of the Bigfoot phenomena have branches of real science, such as primatology, anthropology, biology, and genetics, just to name a few? How have they approached the possible existence of Bigfoot? And is there any scientific, objective evidence, aside from an actual body, of course, that could be a smoking gun in favor of Bigfoot being real? In today's episode of the Paranormal Nothing podcast, Join me, Juan Quiroz, as we take a look at the science of Sasquatch. Who are the figures? What are the studies? And what have been the conclusions when mainstream science has tackled the question of Bigfoot's existence? And based on real science, what could be conjectured as possible explanations for the existence of an animal like Bigfoot? Before we start, I want to level set the field by describing what Bigfoot is for those listeners that might not be familiar with the creature or its lore. I suspect, however, that the case is that most listeners of this podcast have an inkling as to what Bigfoot is alleged to be. After all, a 2018 Chapman University study showed that about 25% of those surveyed in regards to their paranormal beliefs believe that a creature like Bigfoot was real. The creature known as Bigfoot is said to be an upright walking ape-like figure that typically lives in the dense forests of North America, primarily in the Northwest regions, such as the US states of California, Oregon, Washington, and in the Western parts of Canada. But Bigfoot sightings have occurred all over the United States and beyond, 
with variants of the typical Northwest Bigfoot arising in Florida with the skunk ape, in Ohio with the Ohio grassman, and of course with the Yeti in the Himalayan mountains. Delving into the phenomena of the Yeti will be left to a future episode of the Paranormal Nothing podcast. All of these variations of the typical Bigfoot creature ultimately are all subspecies of the main creature. The name Bigfoot itself derives from old Native American stories that talked about local tribesmen finding very large footprints that must have been made by a big foot. And the origin of Bigfoot overall is also derived from stories of quote-unquote wild men, hairy men of the mountains, that often interacted with natives during more simpler times prior to the arrival of what would become Americans. The natives understood that Bigfoot was part of nature, holding their own place in the forest, in the mountains, just like humans did in their own territories. These stories come down to us via Native American oral tradition and are widely known throughout various tribes, especially those originating in the Pacific Northwest. And because of the diversity of Native American tribes that each contain their own Bigfoot lore, at times, Bigfoot has been called Soquatl or even Sesquak, both derivatives of native dialects. But as we know with today's show title, the most famous native name for Bigfoot is Sasquatch. The website for the Canadian Encyclopedia defines the term Sasquatch as follows. The word Sasquatch is believed to be an anglicization of the Salish word Sasquet, meaning wild man or hairy man. J.W. Burns coined the term in the 1930s. Burns was an Indian agent assigned to the Chihalas Band, now known as the Stat Staul, First Nation. The Stat Staul people claim a close bond with Sasket and believe it has the ability to move between the physical and spiritual realm. Sasquatch has also been commonly known as Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the wild hairy man of the woods, have your pick. In theory, the existence of such an entity seems plausible. The world is so big, forests are densely populated with perfect hiding spots in the form of caves, trees, mountains, etc. And as we know, new species of animals are discovered daily. The world is so big, so many mysteries left to uncover. Why couldn't a creature like Bigfoot exist in real life? This type of logic almost sounds like the Fermi Paradox, argument based on the scale of the universe and the plausibility of undiscovered animals abounds. But as we've seen when analyzing other anomalous phenomena on this podcast, plausible or viable does not necessarily mean true. This is a known fallacy in critical thinking made up of two parts. The first part says that a plausible explanation for a phenomena is a true explanation. The second part says that a plausible explanation for a phenomena proves that the phenomena exists. However, it turns out that as we indicated, both of these statements are fallacies and therefore, logically speaking, are destined to fail since they are grounded on the false premise that plausible means probable or true. But if you introduced an objective means, such as mainstream science, to further the cause of plausibility in the direction of possible reality, then the case in favor of the real existence of Sasquatch could begin to take better shape. Enter into the picture Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Born in 1958 in the state of Utah, he would go on to receive a bachelor's degree in zoology from Brigham Young University, better known as BYU, in 1982, and then subsequently a master's degree from BYU in 1984. Then came the PhD in 1989 in the field of anatomical sciences with an emphasis in anthropology. Currently, he is a tenured professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. Why bring up Dr. Meldrum in reference to mainstream science furthering the cause of Sasquatch? This is because Dr. Meldrum is one of a handful of mainstream academic scientists whose focus in their day-to-day -day research is actually Bigfoot himself. Unfortunately, as we've seen with previous academics deciding to pursue anomalous research, like what occurred with Harvard and the late Dr. John Mack, they are often shunned and ostracized within their academic settings. 
Take the following report, for example, from the website of Idaho TV station KLTV. The report overall was discussing the general opinion of Meldrum throughout campus, and with this example, it wasn't a very noble one. On campus, Meldrum, himself a hulking figure with a mop of brown hair, a bristly silver mustache, and a black t shirt with the silhouette of a hunchback lurking Bigfoot, gets funny looks and the silent treatment from other scientists, and is not invited to share coffee with the other science professors. Over the summer, more than 30 professors signed a petition criticizing the university for hosting a Bigfoot symposium where Meldrum was a keynote speaker. He pays for his research with a $30,000 donation from a Bigfoot believer. Still, Meldrum has a distinguished supporter in Jane Goodall, the world-famous authority on African chimpanzees. Her blurb on the jacket of Meldrum's new book, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, lauds him for bringing a much-needed level of scientific analysis to the Bigfoot debate. Meldrum is without a doubt the prominent legitimate researcher of the Bigfoot phenomena within a real academic setting. And he is also a real scientist who happens to also study Sasquatch using the tools of real science. If mainstream science was going to begin to tackle the question of the possible existence of Sasquatch, then Dr. Jeff Meldrum would be the start. He became interested in Bigfoot as a child since he grew up in the Pacific Northwest. As a child, Meldrum recounts that he was taken to the Spokane Coliseum to see a showing of the polarizing Patterson-Gimlin film, which for those that don't know, I suspect you are not one of them, purportedly shows a female Sasquatch walking across a meadow located near Bluff Creek in Northern California. Watching this film piqued Meldrum's interest in primates and their connections not only with humans, but with cryptids such as Sasquatch. As an adult, Meldrum remained interested in Bigfoot, but was for the most part skeptical due to a lack of evidence when the phenomena of Bigfoot was analyzed under the view of the scientific method. This view changed, however, after a camping trip to southeastern Washington in 1996, one of the most active Bigfoot research areas in the world. On that trip, which was to the town of Walla Walla, Washington, he was shown some fresh footprints that as a professional anthropologist specializing in foot morphology in primates, he found hard to explain as having been made by well-known fauna such as bear, elk, or even made by a hoaxer looking to stump Meldrum. Moreover, he had come on this particular trip with the intention of actually unveiling the hoax behind some alleged Bigfoot footprints that had been found and cast in the area by the locals. Instead, seeing the fresh footprints himself made him realize that maybe there was something more concrete behind the legend of Bigfoot that he had been told stories about as a kid. Meldrum's approach to Bigfoot research remained and focused on footprints, since he was an expert at determining the details of locomotion of an animal based on its footprints, primarily those of the bipedal variety. That is why his analysis of the Skookum Bigfoot cast is interesting. The Skookum cast, as it is known in Bigfoot circles, was a plaster cast taken of an alleged Bigfoot that sat down in a mud puddle in the Skookum Meadows of Gifford, Pinchot National Forest in Washington State. This occurred on September 22, 2000, under the watch of the BFRO, short for the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. The Bigfoot in question was apparently attracted to some fruit that had been hung on a line near the group's campsite, in hopes of attracting the creature. Meldrum was not present at the site when the incident occurred, but would go on to study the casts made of the impressions in the mud left by the alleged Bigfoot. Based on his analysis, Meldrum concluded that the Skookum casts contained impressions of a hair-covered hip, elbow, heel, wrist, and buttocks. He concluded that it appeared whatever creature that had left the imprints had actually sat down in the mud and then reached for the fruit hanging from the line. His study of the Skookum cast led Meldrum, a seasoned academic, to conclude that the unique impressions could not have been made by any known animals living in the region. There was also hair samples taken from the area 
where the muddy imprints were left. All of them turned out to belong to deer, elk, coyote, and bear, except one of the hair samples. That one had genetic characteristics of belonging to a primate. Together with the unique ridges, indentations, and patterns in the skookum cast, Meldrum would state that based on his careful analysis of the evidence, he believed that the creature that made the skookum indentations was most probably some type of unknown primate. This declaration was compelling and not easily accepted by the mainstream academic community that Meldrum was a part of. But Meldrum had strong academic research credentials to back up his claims of evidence analyzed in favor of a creature such as Bigfoot. Research that Meldrum conducted at Idaho State did not all focus on Sasquatch. For example, some titles of academic papers he had written not pertaining to Sasquatch included 1. Tail assisted hind limb suspension as a transitional behavior in the evolution of the platyrrhine prehensile tail. 2. Hind limb suspension and hind foot reversal in Varesia variegata and other arboreal mammals. And 3. From biped to strider, the emergence of modern human walking, running, and resource transport. Meldrum also sounds like a seasoned and educated academic. In multiple interviews with Dr. Meldrum that I listened to in preparation for this episode, I could not help but focus on the breadth of knowledge that Dr. Meldrum shows not only when it comes to Bigfoot, but also in his specialty fields of anthropology, anatomy, primatology, and bipedal locomotion in general. Meldrum would go on to coin the term relict hominoid, in reference to what he feels, based on his extensive research, is the true nature of the figure of Sasquatch. In his own words, It is one matter to address the theoretical possibility of a relic species of hominoid in North America, and the obligate shift in paradigm to accommodate it, but there must also be something substantial to place within that revised framework. There must be essential evidence to lend weight to the hypotheses, and counter the critics' various aspersions. I was once confronted by a colleague who declared, after all, these are just stories. My response, stories that apparently leave tracks, shed hair, void scat, vocalize, are observed and described by reliable, experienced witnesses. Hardly just stories. Meldrum has even been able to put forth a possible ichnotaxon where the footprints made by the alleged Sasquatch in the Patterson-Gimlin film referred to earlier. He proposed the ichnotaxon for these titled Anthropopoid Pipes Ameriborealis, which is a direct reference to the term North American ape foot. As a side note, ichnotaxonomy is a formal classification of tracks and traces, primarily done for unknown but extinct animals. In the case of the ichnotaxon that Meldrum proposed for the Sasquatch in the Patterson-Gimlin film, it was assumed that this animal was not yet extinct by all accounts. Furthermore, due to Meldrum's expertise on bipedal locomotion and the origin of such movement in primates and hominids, he would also state the following in reference to what he concluded after conducting analyses on a multitude of alleged Sasquatch footprint casts. The Sasquatch foot seems to be distinguished in its retention of a flexibility of the midfoot, much more similar to a great ape foot in that regard. And that very interesting feature has some intriguing parallels to aspects of the very earliest prominent bipeds. And in fact, provides for me a very interesting juxtaposition of sort of two potentially independent evolutions of bipedalism from a similar starting point that express very similar characteristics in parallel. In other words, he also felt that the evolution of the bipedal functions in the relict hominid known as Sasquatch could be distinctly seen as different from those same functions in the evolutionary record of humanity's own earliest known ancestor bipeds. All of Dr. Meldrum's scientific analyses and volume of research in relation to Sasquatch point to the reality of the phenomena of Sasquatch. 
but Mildred makes it a point to state that he believes that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal, an uncatalogued species of hominid that appears to have evolved in conjunction and side by side with Homo sapiens. But there is also the possibility that Sasquatch, according to Meldrum, is a relict hominoid, a species possibly older than Homo sapiens. A hominoid or hominid, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is defined as, quote, any of a family of erect bipedal primate mammals that includes recent humans together with extinct ancestral and related forms, and in some recent classifications, the great apes, the orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, and bonobo. So the scientific question becomes, if there is an undiscovered species of relict hominoid living predominantly in the dense forests of the North American Pacific Northwest, what exactly brought it there, and where could it have possibly come from? This brings us to the figure of Grover Krantz. Krantz was an American anthropologist having received his doctorate in the field in 1971 from the University of Minnesota. Prior to this, he had received a bachelor's and master's degree from the prestigious UC Berkeley. After completing his PhD, Krantz taught mainstream anthropology full-time at Washington State University until 1998, a span of almost 30 years. He passed away on a day like today, Valentine's Day, 19 years ago in 2002. As a side note, when he died, he had instructed his family to donate his body to science. Curiously, his skeleton and those of his three Irish wolfhounds have been exhibited jointly throughout the years at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. But why is this discussion of Grover Krantz pertinent to the Sasquatch relic hominoid theory of Dr. Jeff Meldrum? Because Krantz was the first true academic to actually take a risk and pursue the study of Bigfoot using the tools of scientific inquiry via his position at Washington State. In a sense, Krantz was Meldrum's predecessor but Krantz's contribution to the authentic scientific pursuit of the origins of Bigfoot would result in the proposal of a theory about the genesis of the relic hominoid itself. After years of review and scientific study of the multiple alleged Bigfoot footprints, in addition to other evidence as we shall see, Krantz declared the following theory. Bigfoot was likely Gigantopithecus an extinct Asian primate that existed from perhaps 9 million to 100,000 years ago. Gigantopithecus may have migrated to North America via the Bering Strait when it was still a land bridge. Krantz arrived at this theory primarily due to having examined a mandible fossil of the ancient hominid and theorized, based on it, that it walked upright, bipedally, and that it shared many characteristics with Sasquatch. He was so sure of his theory on the origin of Bigfoot that Krantz presented a paper in 1985 at the International Society of Cryptozoology in Sussex, England, where he proposed assigning the binomian Gigantopithecus blackae to Sasquatch. As an aside, a binomian in taxonomy is a two-part formal name given to a species. The first part refers to the genus to which the species belongs, in this case, that of Gigantopithecus. The second part refers to the specific species within the genus, in this case, that of Blackai, which is an homage to Canadian paleoanthropologist Davidson Blackai. But Krantz's attempt at labeling Sasquatch as an offshoot of Gigantopithecus was not accepted by the International Commission of Zoological Nomenclature. Like Meldrum, Krantz's reputation as a legitimate scientist and researcher was called into question after continuing to research the Bigfoot phenomena and propose the Gigantopithecus theory for the origin of Bigfoot. Why did Krantz believe that Gigantopithecus was the true nature of Bigfoot? We know about the existence of Gigantopithecus starting in the Pleistocene era due to having discovered over 1,000 teeth fossils most of which were found in southern China. 
no complete or partial skeleton of Gigantopithecus has ever been found, and that includes no teeth fossils found outside of southern Asia. Based on extrapolations from the size and composure of the teeth fossils that have been found, the first one in 1935, paleontologists conjectured that Gigantopithecus stood anywhere from 9 to 12 feet in height and weighed upwards of 600 pounds. They also determined that Gigantopithecus was most closely related to modern orangutans. Based on this description of Gigantopithecus, it could reasonably pass for what is typically described as a Sasquatch. With the question about bipedal motion still unanswered for Gigantopithecus. Furthermore, it is speculated by scientists based on fossil evidence that Gigantopithecus survived until as late as 100,000 years ago, which means that it, in theory, would have shared the landscape with sapient species such as Homo erectus, one of Homo sapiens' early ancestral species. But what do the naysayers say, especially within the science community itself? The BFRO website provides an extensive explanation on the Gigantopithecus theory for Bigfoot, which they call the Bigfoot Giganto theory. In their write-up, they also provide explanations for and against the Bigfoot Giganto theory. The question is then, is the Bigfoot Giganto theory grounded in fundamental science? In regards to the question of bipedal motion, the BFRO website indicates the following. Bigfoot Giganto theorists deal with a few issues that affect the potential linkage of modern Bigfoot reports to ancient Gigantos. Probably the most crucial question concerns whether Gigantos walked upright. There is more than one school of thought among many anthropologists regarding this issue. Some physical anthropologists interpret the scant fossilized remains to indicate an upright walking ape, measuring an impressive 9 feet tall and weighing more than 1,000 pounds. The general description of Bigfoot type creatures reported for centuries in North America and Asia. Even if giganto posture is uncertain, no one can reasonably dispute the conclusion that gigantos were the largest primates that ever walked the earth. Another ongoing question regarding the Gigantopithecus theory for Bigfoot is how could a temperate climate ape like Gigantopithecus have adapted to colder and wetter climates like those in the Pacific Northwest, if we are to believe that Gigantopithecus crossed the Bering Land Bridge during the last ice age in order to reach North America. This is since there have never been fossil remains found of Gigantopithecus within North America. The BFRO website provides a response to this. Bigfoot Giganto theorists believe that Gigantos' large brain size, perhaps the largest in the terrestrial animal kingdom, and upright walking posture facilitated their dispersion across Asia and North America. Thousands of years of adaptation to temperate and mountainous climates, it is believed, would have given these large upright walking apes the ability to tolerate cold temperatures, climb through deep snow, and cross high mountain ranges with relative ease. Given the large amounts of time available since the onset of the Ice Age, if it was that the Gigantopithecus species did cross the Bering Land Bridge, then thousands of years of adaptation could have led an initial group of Gigantopithecus to arrive in North America and make the physical transition from living in temperate climates to colder climates at their final destinations. And another key point is that the Pacific Northwest was a direct shot when heading due east from Asia, and that is where the Bering Land Bridge would have formed. Ultimately, Grover Krantz, the first academic to take the Bigfoot phenomena seriously, would not have lightly made the claim that Bigfoot might be Gigantopithecus alive today, just an evolved Gigantopithecus, adapted perfectly to wetter, colder climates. If Gigantopithecus is Bigfoot, then we could also state that Gigantopithecus further evolved a skill of keeping closely to themselves away from discovery by their fellow hominids in the form of Homo sapien. 
But in terms of Gigantopithecus fossils, even just teeth, there have been none found in North America, and only mandible fossils and teeth fossils have been found of Gigantopithecus, but in Asia. Until a discovery is made of at least a partial Gigantopithecus skeleton, questions will remain as to the true physical attributes of the original Gigantopithecus and how it compared to the alleged modern-day Sasquatch. We've discussed the works of verifiable academic scientists Grover Krantz and Jeff Meldrum, and also reviewed theories regarding Bigfoot being an adapted subspecies of a Pleistocene-era Gigantopithecus relict hominid, and we know about the myriad of eyewitness accounts talked about in various podcasts, TV shows, TV interviews, and to individuals like myself every day. On this last note, a 2010 study titled The Prevalence of Lying in America, Three Studies of Self-Reported Lies, study conducted by Michigan State University, concluded that the majority of lies reported by respondents belonged to only 5.3% of the overall respondent population. If we know that at least 25% of the paranormal believing population believes in the existence of Bigfoot based on the Chapman University study alluded to at the beginning of today's episode, then combining it with the Michigan State study results, we can mathematically extrapolate that only a small percentage of the 25% of people that responded to the Chapman University study were lying. That means that the majority of the individuals that believed in Bigfoot based on the study truthfully believed in the phenomena, and we can assume that there might have been personal encounters with the creature that ultimately led to their honest belief in Sasquatch. But nevertheless, the retelling of an encounter without verifiable evidence will always be just that, a story but nothing more. What would it take to definitively prove the real existence of Bigfoot? In the opinion of many Bigfoot researchers and that of your humble narrator, it would take no more than a Sasquatch body to be found, the body being dead or alive. For example, prior to 2014, scientists had not been able to study firsthand the heart of a blue whale. They suspected that it was the largest heart of all animals on Earth, but they had not been able to find a blue whale carcass that had its heart somewhat intact in order to extract and study it. This changed in 2014, when a 78-foot blue whale carcass washed up on the coast of Newfoundland. Scientists were able to extract the 400-pound heart from the whale and were then able to study it closely for the first time in recorded history. This example illustrates how, unfortunately, the dead body of a mysterious animal like the blue whale can provide an opportunity for science to answer many previously unknown questions about its anatomy. In the opinion of your humble narrator, a Sasquatch body, dead or alive, will provide the definitive proof of Bigfoot. But until then, there is substantial, authentic, scientific evidence to show that there is some type of relict hominoid, to use Dr. Meldrum's term, alive and thriving in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, and possibly beyond. Even without eyewitness accounts of seeing the creature, the footprint evidence when analyzed by specialists like Drs. Meldrum and Krantz, points to the reality of a missing hominid in our hominid evolutionary spectrum. To end today's episode, I'd like to read a quote from famed chimpanzee researcher and conservationist Jane Goodall, who vouched for Dr. Meldrum in his pursuit of Sasquatch research as a legitimate scientific discipline. I'm a romantic. I would like Bigfoot to exist. I've met people who swear they've seen Bigfoot. And I think the interesting thing is, every single continent, there's an equivalent of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. There's the Yeti, the Yaoi in Australia, the Chinese wild man, and on and on and on. Thank you for listening. And as always, question everything.